uh, this open source e-commerce framework, and we are looking to hire developers one and a half on Rails and open source, and we have a metro accessible office up near Bethesda French Pikes. So just come find me after you're interested. Or just want to talk about this great in general. Cool. Um, there's some other hands. Oh, yes. uh, Matt Gerke from Skeptiv. Uh, we are a startup who, that uh, essentially is fact checking every sentence on the internet. And we're gonna, we have a toolbar plugin that uh, underlines sentences that are factually incorrect. Um, we're looking to hire somebody, uh, a Rails developer. Cool. Uh, the blue shirt. Hey guys, I'm Mike Gibson. Uh, I work with the Solar System. We do renewable energy finance. Uh, we are looking to hire a Ruby developer and to build a mid level. Uh, we have a big project in the works, and we're hoping to revolutionize the energy investment space. So, I'll be here to get Cool. Um, there was some other hands. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Um, I'm David Young, I work for Symantec, and I'm part of a small division within them that is going to be in Herndon. We're just moving out there, and we are building a uh, consumer-based cloud file storage services. So if you're interested in a Ruby development job, your Ruby and Rails development job in that area, find me, come talk to me, please. Or me. Or, oh, really? Yes. Um, I think there were other hands. Maybe someone over here. No. All right, cool. Well, if any of these um, opportunities sound interesting, please. Hey, Joe, can you ask who's looking? Oh, sure. All right, quick show of hands who is looking. Anyone's looking? I'll also mention that you, anyone who's hiring is welcome to post one message on our message board outlining um, <laughs> their company and their positions. Um, I, you know, we've got like 700 something members. Obviously, not everyone is here right now. Um, or if you know someone who might be interested, by all means, seek these guys out uh, at the bar afterwards or um, before they leave. Um, yeah, or if you just don't want your boss is here and you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> I have a friend who's looking for a job. <laughs> I, I, a friend of a friend is looking for a job. Um, so, um, does anyone have any other announcements? Any? Uh, yes, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Schaefer, and I'm applying for a small business initiative research grant. Um, the project is sort of a social media type um, kind of thing. And I'm looking for somebody who is a really, really good programmer. Not necessarily Ruby, but just a good programmer. And um, so here's, here's the, the bad part. It's like, I don't know if we'll get the, the grant. I don't know when it'll start. Probably February. And it'll probably last for um, nine months, and if it goes well, then it would be full time for two years after that. But the nine months is just sort of a part time thing to see how it goes. So if anybody's interested, or if you know somebody might be interested, let me know. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I along with Chris and Sean Marcia started Arlington Ruby. We meet every two weeks on Wednesdays. Um, next meeting is uh, next Wednesday. Uh, come out, check it out. Uh, if you're interested in doing a presentation. We're a smaller group, so it might be a good place to practice if you don't want to be in front of a large group like this. But um, and you can do both. Where do you, you do both that? too? Yeah. There, uh, where, where do you where? meet? Uh, sorry, uh, in Arlington, uh, near the Clarendon Metro. So very close. It's it's, it's in uh, George. Do you have like a web link or something? ArlingtonRuby.org. Okay. And if you go to the um, DC Ruby Users Group uh, web meetup web page, they also cross post announcements. Uh, yes, yeah, another uh, announcement. I represent a company called The Molly Fool. Um, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have not. But uh, we have a community intelligence platform around investing in stock picking. Uh, we're, we open source the data and we're looking for people who would like to have on that. So, go ahead and find Oh, excellent. Any other announcements? All right, then without further ado, um, we will get started with the basics of Ruby Gems. Hi, um, my name is Chris Sexton, uh, and I am going to talk a little bit about making Ruby Gems and kind of the philosophy and uh, mindset uh, that you should have when you're actually going through and, and making a library or, or uh, app that, that uses one. Um, so a lot of people have seen this floating around. Um, I would be happy if this showed up in every Ruby presentation that was ever made. Um, is this kind of general concept in the Ruby community called Miniswan. And um, it's Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. <laughs> and so 
a lot of the things that you do when you're making a gym or you know the guidelines that you should follow are based off of how your library will play nice in this overall ecosystem. And um, there's a couple of things that uh, like I recommend doing that um, seem to be kind of best practices, but some people um, also don't necessarily agree. Um, and I think we should always kind of err on the side of doing something that's going to help it live in the ecosystem, um, especially especially when it's a library. Um, you know, and I think the first thing we can do uh, to be nice is have nice version numbers. Um, I like to follow something uh, called semantic versioning, um, and you can read about this on semverb.org. Um, and basically, what it what it breaks down to is um, uh, this is what a version number should be, and this is and this is uh, why you you increment the numbers. And I've worked in a bunch of different places on a bunch of different projects. And they all have their own kind of versioning scheme. Um, and it's really nice to kind of see this being adopted. Um, you know, you, every time you release, every time you push anything to uh, rubygems.org or you know, release it anywhere that people can, can collaborate on it, you bump the build number. Um, you know, anytime something isn't uh, backwards compatible, you bump the minor, the, uh, minor yeah, sorry, you bump the minor number anytime it is backwards compatible. So, you're, you know, you keep incrementing that as you release versions. But if you're going to break something, remove an API call, uh, you know, change the way something works. That you know, when people are using it the right way, might be different. Uh, you should always bump the major version number. Uh, and the Ruby Gem system also does something nice. Uh, it lets you assign pre-release uh, version numbers, which is uh, especially slick because you can. Uh, deploy it, and um, people would have to run that test pre when they go to install it. So you wouldn't necessarily get it, but say Rails can, can put it out there, and people can pick it up. Uh, so when we when we have these version numbers, we can use these to kind of control our dependencies. Um, and there's a couple of different uh, ways you can do this. If you're tied very strictly to a version, you would just do equals, you know, on your gem file when you're doing install. Just say equals, and then the version number, and it will always give you exactly that version. Um, and you can do kind of this, uh, the jabby arrow, um, and the way that works is it will let you um, increment the, the least significant uh, number in your version number, uh, but not go over. So 3.0, 3 3.1, 3.2, but if it went to 4.0, it would, it, would, it would not grab that one. So if it, you know, that should change backwards compatibility. Uh, <coughs> So you don't necessarily want to get those, but it'll let you kind of keep up to date with bug fixes. Is that the official name for that operator? <laughs> um, I, I believe, oh, I forget. Well, I feel like Jim Weirich uh, called it the Spermy operator. <laughs> and if you read through the Ruby Jim's documentation, they refer to it as the Spermy operator. I like Jackie Arrow. I don't know why. Um, and then there's also the really greedy one at the bottom, which um, I would, I kind of feel fairly strongly you shouldn't ever use this. Um, like the mega horn, I guess, um, and that will just keep upgrading always. And um, and so when people when people go and run bundle update and they have this and you uh, run all your tests and they just scream e at you um, because somebody has a has a new library that uh, breaks compatibility. Um, so the next way we can be nice when we're working on gems is through uh, the names, the way we actually name our gems. Uh, so, uh, Eric Hall, one of the guys who uh, maintains Ruby Gems, suggests, and I didn't really agree with this at first, but use underscores in your names. So if you're going to separate words, use underscores. And this is really just to kind of play nice, uh, especially like when you're in uh, Ruby, you know, actually in your code, you separate your names with underscores. Um, and so if you the actual library is named that way. When you do require, it'll match, and then the, the variables will match within the code. Um, and then you just use uh, dashes or hyphens for extensions. Um, and that way, you know, there, there's a number of them. You know, rspec, uh, you know, dash whatever extension, um, it extends another gem. And so you kind of get the sense of, of what the gem is doing just by the name. Um, and kind of probably the most important of the naming ones is don't use uppercase, uh, don't use initial caps or all uppercase. Uh, it just <coughs> doesn't fit into the to the uh, Ruby Gems world. Um, 
This is actually one of the things that's somewhat controversial. Um, don't require Ruby gems in your Ruby gem. When you're building a gem, um, or when you install it with Ruby gems, that means that system has already been loaded. So it's just redundant. Um, but if you put it in there, then people are forced to use it. And Ryan Tomeko actually said it really well. And the basic gist of that is you don't want to force people um, to do things your way. If you, know, you write a library, you want people to be able to use your library, um, and you don't want them to be held back from doing that because your sysadmin uh, doesn't like to, to install it with RubyGems and wants to use RPMs or something like that. Uh. <laughs> so, <coughs> this is the basic structure of a uh, gem, and this is important um, uh, with the way it'll actually play kind of uh, with, with the other things on the system. Uh, and you see that lib folder. That lib folder gets added to the load path. So to understand how this works, we need to understand what a load path is. Uh, and it's roughly equivalent to like the path environment variable used to add commands to a system. It's just an array of directories. Um, but they can also kind of act like a namespace. So you can nest directories underneath your own directory. So I can namespace everything I have in my from my gem under my gem, uh, and when I do my gem or require my gem factory, it's going to load uh, from the lib folder in your gem, you know my gem factory. Because uh, you don't really want to have to go through and do something like require factory, uh, whereas somebody else might already have have a factory file somewhere. Uh, and the way you kind of control this. Uh, is you only have one Ruby file at the root or in your lib folder. Uh, everything else, and it should be named the exact same thing as, as the gem itself, and everything else is nested under a folder with the exact same name. And when you follow this convention, um, everything just kind of loads and makes sense, and you kind of uh, know where it is. Uh, so you can go through and require a gem, which will match uh, the, the name of the gym that you install, which has the same name uh, in your module for, uh, for the actual gym, the name so either the module or the class. And they all kind of match and they all kind of follow the same convention. Um, and so half the time you don't have to go look up anything, you just, you just kind of know how it's going to gonna fall. Why is there an underscore in the last? So um, in Ruby, the convention for constants is to start with, well, uh, an initial capital letter, it's actually kind of a, uh, how the language works. If you have an initial capital letter, it'll treat it like a constant. And um, so for class names and module names, what you do is you do a capital case. Uh, all right, so that, that's kind of the basics of the philosophy, I think, it, that, that's important when you're, when you're uh, writing one of these. So let's look really quick at putting one together. So let's make something. Uh, here's some of the tools that I think are um, pretty popular, or at least have been popular at one point. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile to do the first one, just manually make the files once, and then you'll know how everything fits together. But after you do that once, it gets really old. Um, and so uh, I've been using Jeweler for a long time and was, was really happy with it. And when I was originally putting this talk together, um, I decided I'd try Bundler since I was using that everywhere else anyways. Um, and it turns out to be uh, very straightforward. So let's do one with Bundler. So uh, the Bundle command has uh, a gem command with it. And it's, it'll just generate the gem itself. And so I'm going to make a gem here called Hue and it's for a color coding output in a terminal. Um, so when I run bundle gym hue, it creates my project for me, just like running Rails new. So we go into that directory. Uh, we'll go ahead and commit our code. 
Sweet. All right, so now we have an empty project. It doesn't do anything at all. And so what's the first thing we're going to do? First thing we do is write a test. In order to write a test, we have to include a test library. So we kind of take a step back. Um, this is a gem spec. The only thing that really matters is this, this dependency, and I'm going to include our spec using my little stem arrow. Um, now I'm going to run bundle. It's going to add the uh, install the library for, for me. Make a directory to store our specs in. Uh, we're going to go and edit our, our the actual uh, spec helper and uh, edit the test. And let's see what they have in those files. So the top one is the spec helper. Um, and all we're doing is including our spec, and we're going to require our library. Um, there's a little bit of hijinks at the top that's just to kind of get the path right to load the, load the file that's one directory up in the folder. Um, and then we actually write our test. So just like any other RSpec test, this could be test unit, it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, all, you know, these, these are the two lines that really matter. Um, we want to run q.red and make sure that it includes this bizarre state code. So, as we write our test, we run it, we have to see it fail, and it does fail. So, let's write our implementation. Just about as simple as we can get. It's got a module Q, there's uh, you know, class method red, and you can pass in a string and format those. So, we run our specs, and they're green. They're gray. Alright, we're doing something. Wait, what is, what is <coughs> RSpec? RSpec is just a testing library. So it's just, it has, it, the library when you install it comes with a command called RSpec. You just point out one of those files and it'll run it for you. It's just, it's great. Um, so, uh, one of the common things we want to do in uh, RubyGem is actually have a command, like the RSpec command that can can be run when you do gem install. Um, so first we're going to make a directory called bin. Uh, and we're going to edit, the, edit a file in there called q. Notice we're naming it the exact same thing as our gem. Uh, and we'll make it executable. So here's what's in that file. So. Uh, we do a little bit of path manipulation to make sure that we can load the file that's one directory up in the loop folder. Um, and then we require that. Um, and all our uh, command does is just call red and pass in everything from RV joined together with spaces. So when we actually go and run this, we, we commit it. Um, we can build it. And this will spit, when you, when you actually do this, it will spit out a, a .gem file, um, which you could pass around between machines if you needed to. Um, and we ran into a problem. So the error says we need to change these fix me's and twos in the gem spec. So we open up our big ugly file that Bundler generated for us, and we see two twos in here. So I just go through and, and change those to my name and email address and little little quick description. So let's try, to try this again. So we're going to build our gym. <coughs> Sweet. You see it just spit out, uh, you know, Q with the version number, dot gem. So we can actually install it. Um, and that will put it right on our system. And um, then we actually go open up another terminal somewhere else. And uh, that command will be available because it's been installed with the gems. Um, and we can actually run it. Um, we run you, we pass it yay, and it spits out red. Um, we close that terminal and we go somewhere else and we can run IRB. Um, and in IRB, so being one on one nine, um, we can just run require you, otherwise, you have to put uh, Ruby Joe's. Um, the new versions of Ruby don't require you to do that. You just run require, um, it's going to load up our library. Uh, and now we can just call it, just like any other API, and we'll just output it. So, any questions?
sir. So the whole be nice things, and then specifically requiring Ruby gems, the, is that your personal preference, or based on a community preference, or statistical? Um, so the guys that actually maintain Ruby gems um, endorse that. Uh, I, I think it's it's. I think there's a fairly good community kind of best practices opinion behind that. There's, so is the main there are a handful of people who don't use Ruby gems, and it interferes with the um, way that they do handle it because they don't like whatever it does with the load path or whatever. Right. And when you require Ruby gems, it forces it into the system. So why does Ruby right. gems even allow that then? It's it's your code. So if you say I'm requiring Ruby gems and someone else doesn't want to use that library manager, you're saying to use my library, you must have Ruby gems. Yeah, but why does that matter if A, you're writing a Ruby gem and B, <laughs> 1.9 doesn't require you to require Ruby gems? Do you, uh, well, I mean, so it, it mostly doesn't matter. Um, and, and like we said at the back, it was, it's really, the only time it really matters is when somebody wants to manage these things very carefully themselves. And so, um, you know, sometimes you get the very controlling sysadmin and he wants to put stuff in like libraries and control exactly where stuff lives and put things in the low path manually versus creating a big array. Um, and then you'll hear some people complain like, oh, the, the array is too big, I have too many libraries uh, because of Ruby Jones. Um, right. Yeah, but and I think the main reason, above all, is it's just not necessary. You don't need to do it. Um, that's why I had those kind of ugly path mangling things, um, like in my uh, <coughs> executable. Uh, if you if you just put in one of these little tricks, now your library will play nice for people that want to use other, you know, if they want to use what's it, um, like RIP or some of these other, uh, you know, library managing uh, applications. What if you do what? Assuming that you were writing under 1.8, 7, or 6, and you yourself require or dependent on a Ruby gem, because you, I saw that you added a dependency for development, but not a, a dependency for production. Um, what do you mean? I don't. What if I you? depend on uh, uh, Nobuhiri? My gem, my gem depends on Nobuhiri. Um, so that's not a problem because by the time your gem is getting loaded, you know, if you're using Ruby gems, it's already loaded. So when it's you going to Ruby in your Ruby application. Right. Yeah, but how do I do it in my gem? If I'm writing my gem, that requires it. Oh, in the actual gem itself? Yeah. Um, so you can kind of mangle some of these things. Um, you can require no go theory. Right. You, can have you just don't require a Ruby gem. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, exactly. So the specification allows you to define a dependency. It's up to someone else to figure out how to resolve it. Okay, so I, it's I, weird that you would you, do it that you way. You have to require it and have it be local, not in the Ruby gem. Because otherwise, under 1.8, 1.6, it won't find it unless you. If someone has whatever else, if you're not using Ruby gems, it's up to you to figure out how to resolve it. Yeah. The client uses the package management. The client does the package management. Ruby gems is both package management, package installation, and runtime loading. Right. And require Ruby gems is the runtime loading, and that's the thing some people don't want. So they want it for the code distribution, you know, hey, I can gem install and get the package. But they don't necessarily want it at runtime because they don't like the behavior. So the only time I would see it necessary is if you were, if you were writing very simple tests. Uh, you might want to include the regen in 187 for just the tests. But, you know, in my case, I'm using, you know, firing these things up with RSpec, which happens to be Ruby gem. Which is going to load all my files for me, which is already loaded with Ruby gems. So most of the, most of the time, it's just there, uh, and, and you should just shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> uh, anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Show up for your slide. Yes, it did. Cool. All right. All right. So, uh, as uh, we just introduced, my name is Patrick Peake. Uh, I work for a company called Browse Media. 
Um, that's my personal information, uh, email, Twitter handle if you have questions about this presentation or what kind of anything uh, we talked about today. Hopefully this talk should dovetail pretty nicely with Chris's. Um, he talked a little bit about gems and packaging and I'm going to talk about you know, how RubyGems you know, allows you to do some interesting things when you're distributing binary files. So let's talk about Thor. So these are the things we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to talk about Thor, uh, what it is. Um, I'm going to also talk a little bit about Rails generators um, because Rails generators and Rails 3 are built on top of Thor. So if you know one, you can know the other a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about how to sort of usefully test command line applications. Uh, and then we'll talk finally about uh, application templates, which are something that's not used a lot, but it, it kind of brings together some of the, um, some of the other behaviors. Uh, of, of Thor. What I'm not going to do is talk about Thor as a rate replacement. I know there are folks that use Thor for that purpose. I don't, so I really feel qualified to go into it, plus the talk's already long enough as it is. <laughs> um, so Thor, this is what, if you go to uh, rubygems.org, this is what you'll see for a description. Um, a scripting framework that replaces rake, Saki, um, RubyGen. In practice, I don't know how much this actually occurs. I think it, it's my sort of perception, and other folks can tell me otherwise, that Rake is still kind of the standard. Um, but Thor has sort of permeated out as a command line tool and for generators because of um, Rails 3. Uh, it was originally created, I believe, by Yehuda Katz, who also had a very strong hand in uh, Rails 3, which is probably why you see it kind of dovetailing there. All right, so why would you use Thor? What are the, what are the reasons? Um, as, as Chris showed, when he was building a, a command line binary, you don't need something like Thor to go ahead and write a really simple command line tool. However, as you try to build more sort of complex uh, applications and you want to have more sort of command line options, you're going to need to do something uh, along the lines of option parsing to take that command line input and turn it into something useful. Um, Thor provides some structure around that, some helpful things. Uh, another thing it does is provide some very helpful self-documenting um, tips. So when I go into another command line tool, I can look at that and kind of tell immediately, okay, what can I do with this tool? It, it helps me figure out how to document that. Um, another reason that's a pretty good one is that if you're using Rails 3, this is already installed. So it's not an additional dependency sort of above and beyond the stuff that folks are going to have on their system already if they're doing Rails development. Um, it does also provide a very useful series of sort of file and directory manipulation tasks. So you don't need to write these yourself. You can just kind of fall in on what they've got. Um, and then the final reason is if you're doing any sort of Rails generators, if you want to make your own generator, you're going to need to know how this stuff works. Um, so we'll talk about the three flavors of code generation through this, uh, this talk. The first one is, is going to be very common to most folks. Uh, it's just a, running a generator. Um, this is one of the ways that folks very often get introduced to Rails early on as they see generators being run. They go, wow, look at all that code I don't have to write. Um, in this case, we're just generating a model. Uh, another way to do it is as a command line tool. I can just run, in this case, the command's name is GD. I'll talk about what that is later. Um, but I, I, I'm calling it a feature uh, task, and I'm passing in some information, which is new widget. Uh, and the final is using a application template. And we'll talk about this last, but it's the idea that when you start a new Rails project, there's very often a bunch of things you want to configure or set up, and you might do that the same way. You may always use, say, device for your, uh, your authentication framework. So having to go in and configure that each time is kind of a pain. And application templates let you kind of pull that out into a reusable uh, logic. Um, so generators, uh, I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but I do want to ask you. For folks that are kind of new to Rails, have you used? Is there anyone who has not used generators or isn't familiar with the basic concept of what a generator is from a usage standpoint? Okay. So the idea with generators is that Rails provides a bunch of things you can use. I can write. I can type Rails G. That's generate. I, I pass it the name of the generator. In this case, I want to generate a model, and then I pass in information about the name of the model, and then a bunch of attributes. Uh, in this case, I want to create a model called Turtle with one attribute called name that's of type string. And what we can see here with Rails 3 is it's going to invoke a, a series of generators. In this case, the first one it's invoking is active record, which builds a migration, and then a model class. And then it goes and adds a bunch of uh, tests um, using test unit. Uh, and the nice thing about uh, Rails 3 is you can actually substitute different generators. So if my preference is RSpec, uh, which is what Chris demonstrated, I can substitute in the RSpec generator instead of using test unit. Or if I want to use mini test and spec or something like that, I can sub that in, and every time I run my run my poor Rails generators, it'll use the one that I want to use. 
So I'm not going to talk too much about using this, but I do want to talk about how I actually make my own on a project. And I'm not sure how readable that is in the back, but can you guys see this, this over here reasonably well? So the, uh, the idea is that in Rails 3, you actually have a generator generator, which is this lovely little meta thing. You can go in and say, I want to generate a new generator called product. Uh, and it'll go ahead and build uh, a couple files here. The, the, the important ones are the generator itself, which in this case is the product generator, a usage file, which is going to be documentation, and then a templates directory. And I'll cover what those are uh, in a bit. I've got a brief uh, sort of screenshot of what the created directory structure looks like. And the goal is once we've built this generator, this is what we want to allow our users to invoke. I want to be able to say Rails G generate product, pass an information turtle, and then get that get that files built. So this is a little bit busy, and I'm going to walk through this kind of one at a time. This is actually not what gets generated. I filled in most of this myself. So with my product generator, I want to do two things. I want to create a model file, and I want to create a test file. So we see two methods here. We see create product up at the top, and then create unit test. And with a, a Rails generator, every public method in this file is going to get invoked in order from top to bottom. So what's going to happen when I invoke this is product create product is going to get invoked first, and then create unit test will get invoked next. So the, the most of the common things you're doing with a generator are actually creating files, and there's a couple ways to do this. The first one is using this method create file. It's one of the sort of standard uh, rail generator actions. I basically I pass it the name of a file, and then I pass it the code that I want to go into the file. Um, and so you can see here from file down to here, this is the actual body of what's going to get put in there. And you can see I'm do, it's doing string um, interpolation to fill in information about what I want to do. And so in the previous slide, I go, I, the information we passed in was turtle. That's the name of the product. Rails, Rails 3 provides this named base as sort of the core class for a lot of generators. That basically just takes one argument as a mandatory thing, which is the name. In this case, it's turtle. And then it provides us a bunch of methods that sort of munge that in the way that Rails normally does it. So we can see this file name here that's provided to us by um, named base. That basically says, okay, I give it a capital T turtle. I'm going to turn that into a lower T, you know, the way it would be in a file name. It also provides me with these, this plural name, which will be turtles, which I can then use to do interesting things like, um, you know, pass in a reader for that, and it will get generated out in a, in a plural form. I can also provide my own methods, which are used in the templates. What I've done down here is I've created my own method. I've made it private so that it won't be invoked, but I can expose it to the templates to be used. In this case, I want to take the class name, which is going to be, again, in, in as Chris mentioned, constants are always start with a capital, so that's going to be turtle. I'm going to make sure that it's capitalized. Again, that's probably not necessary. And then I'm going to tag product. So what's going to happen is when this file gets created, it's going to be called uh, turtle underscore product. It's going to have a class, which is going to be turtle product. And then it's going to have one, one attribute reader, which is going to be based on the name of the, um, the, the file that got passed in. So any questions about this sort of inline version of the template, I know that's kind of a lot to throw at you, but it's kind of the template to the basis for a lot of Rails generators. Would plural name singularize be the same as file name? Would that be a lowercase? It, it might be. I was just, I'm kind of just throwing a bunch of things at it to demonstrate. Um, but it, it might be. This is just a quick throwaway example. Um, and again, all that's documented on name base, so you can look at that in the Rails API documentation. But that's a good question. Uh, the, other, the other way that files more typically get generated, because as you can tell, this is really only like a four-line or three-line file that we're generating here, and it's already kind of cluttering up our code. More typically, these templates are actually moved out into an external file. In this case, using the template method, we're going to look for a file called test underscore unit rb dot erb, and then we're going to generate a file out based on you know, the name of what we want here. So what we're, the file we want to generate is test unit models turtle underscore product underscore test. And we'll take a look at what that um, test unit ERB file looks like. And so because these are just ERB files, rather than sort of just raw string interpolation, they follow all the same sort of escaping rules and syntax for doing um, uh, ERB output here. But in this case, we want to grab the class name that has already been exposed. All those same private methods are also available to call here. So you can do complicated calculations as a private method and then just you know, call it multiple times throughout the, uh, the test. 
So this is kind of how Rails typically does it anytime you're doing a template. Um, this, so you'll see these. And these typically go right in the templates directory that gets generated for you by Rails, but you can actually munch that a little bit. Um, if you look up at the top, I skipped over it, where it says source root, that's just figuring out where <coughs> does my generator look in order to find these template files. And so by default, it's just templates, but you can change that. Um, and that's more important later on. I've done some, some cute things with actual Thor applications that look for templates in weird places on the file system. So questions about templates? No? All right, so to recap, the key generator points are all of the public methods are invoked in order of declaration. Private methods are available, but they're not automatically invoked. Um, you can have inline or external templates. They can be in the file or stored elsewhere. Um, and I didn't mention this before, but the working directory is always considered to be the root of the project, right? So when I generate the file and it says app models, that's from the root of the project. So some of the useful commands that you can, when you're building your generator, I showed just sort of two simple examples of you know, file generation, but there's a number of other cute things you can do. Um, and really the API documentation is the best place to look for this. Thor provides a series of, of actions, and these are very basic sort of file system operations. Some of the ones you might find yourself using are um, you know, the run command. If you just want to run some shell command as part of your, your generator or your Thor application, you can just type run. And that's, in this case, I'm just running the git command and then passing in some variables. And that'll handle it in a nice sort of platform independent way, which if you have to worry about Windows and Mac and Unix, you know, gives you a little bit of safety there, which is nice. Uh, remove file, if you just want to maybe start your project, you just want to get rid of that basic uh, Rails index study uh, HTML file, you can call remove file. Uh, we talked about template already. Uh, another nice one is get. You can go out and fetch a file from the internet, pull it down, stick it into your project with a specific name. Uh, and then append a file, which is, which is one of the basics for a lot of other uh, Rails actions. You just want to take a file and just stick some code right at the end of it. In this case, I'm taking the file called uh, config environment test, and then I want to append this to the end of it. And there's also an insert file uh, as well. Yes? I had a question about append a file. Is there an option to append if the, only if the file exists? I have no idea. Yeah, okay. I don't think so. I was just curious. If you you can probably you can probably check for the existence of the file like in the generator yeah, itself. Yeah, so yeah, if yeah. file exists, then do this. Um, and I would have to look actually at the. Um, I didn't see it. I was just curious if you came across it. It'd be handy. Like you know, if a site has a robots.txt, okay, we'll add this to robots.txt. Right. Yeah, I, I I don't know off the top of my head, okay. but it might be there. So. Uh, and then so layered on top of the base things that Thor lets you do or provides for you is uh, the Rails generator. And these, again, are very specific to how Rails does things. Um, so it's going to be Rails-specific stuff or, or sort of Rails-specific project things. Again, the API documentation is the best place to look for this. Um, some of the more common ones are gem. Uh, you want to create a project, you want to stick the name of a gem in here. In this case, we're going to add the cucumber gem uh, for the test group. That's going to get put right in the gem file. Um, you can run a generator as part of your generator, which is very nice. You can, you can add some files, you can actually build the generator into a project and then run that generator. In this case, we want to invoke the same product generator that we just created. And this, that invokes it passing it the, the parameter turtle. Um, Rails does provide a git command that you can use directly that instead of having to run git, you can just do git and then pass it the information. Uh, and you can also do two very Rails specific things. You can add stuff to the routes file and add it to initializers. There's basically all of the standard stock Rails files. There's usually uh, a command to stick things in there like in the environment file, things of that nature. So, questions about these? No? Okay, so putting, the, putting aside the generators and then the sort of core things that Thor provides for us, why would we want to build a command line app using um, very often, you know, I find myself, I do a bunch of commands, um, you know, I was writing something the other day and I wanted to like, you know, push a bunch of files to a server, I just want to write a script because instead of writing down a bunch of tedious steps, I want to actually make, make it a command so I can forget what those steps are and then just script it. Um, you can do generation in a project without having to have a, a Rails generator to go along with it. Um, the command Rails new. Rails itself is fundamentally using Thor to provide those different commands to, to output stuff um, and provide new and um, uh, its other functions. 
The nice thing about it is you can also package your binary as, as part of a gem. As, as Chris mentioned, then you can install that gem. It will figure out the dependencies that it belongs to. When someone installs your gem, they'll have that command available to them, and it will automatically uh, work because of the dependency resolution. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes do this as well. I don't want to have a, a list of generators. If there's a generator I use just once on a project, then I don't want it cluttering up that list. I can write a command line app using Thor. I get access to the same uh, underlying actions, but then it doesn't need to be cluttering that list anymore. Um, and one of the ones that I like a lot, a lot is the kind of self-documentation. Very often I'll be using a command line tool. I'll forget the, the exact syntax. I want to be able to go back to it, just type the name of the command and have it say, okay, this is all the things I can do. <coughs> Um, and so I'm going to gloss by these because this is basically uh, Chris's presentation in two slides. Um, gem bun you know, bundle gem, we don't create a gem called pet store. It creates all the exact same stuff here. Uh, the two important things I will point out is your gem file when you're building a gem is going to be very limited. It's really basically saying I depend on whatever the, the gem spec says I do. And this, this was kind of a transition. If you look at older uh, gems, they may have some stuff in the gem file. They may have stuff in the, the gem spec. This is the way that I've sort of come to it, and I think this is may, maybe moving in this direction. But you keep all your dependencies here, and then you just say, okay, gem file depends on gem spec, and then you never touch that file again for, for your gem. Your application file will have a lot more in your gem spec. Um, and then the other cute thing I'll point out here is, this, this line is pretty important for what we're talking about here. What this basically says is, here are the executables that come with this gem. So when I install it on my system, this is what needs to go into the path. Um, and Chris didn't touch on this, but I know why he put some of these things in there is, when you build a gem, when you put this together, it's actually running git commands to figure out what files you've checked in are actually in your binary directory. And so, one of the things that we were talking about before this was that if you don't check in that binary file, it's a, it's a new file and it's not there, Git doesn't know about it, so this will fail and you'll have no binary. So you have to actually like check all those files in before you can actually build your gem. All right, so here's the very sort of simple, stupid, hello world version of uh, a Thor application. And a lot of the requires up at the top, uh, Again, I've, I've violated the, the require Ruby gems here already, um, but it shouldn't be necessary, and I've actually figured out how to work around that later. Um, but we have to require Thor, because our lock, the, the command line tool we're, we're building requires that. And I've also required this uh, Rails generator actions, which is going to get me access to the stuff uh, Rails provides. To, to actually create a, a Thor application, you need really just kind of two things. You need a class that extends the Thor class, and then you need to say that class dot start, and that basically makes all of the commands in there available to be called from the command line. Uh, and in this case, we've got exactly one command. It's called hello. We we also have to provide it this documentation to say, okay, what is this method? What does it do? Uh, in this case, it's hello. And then what this does is when we actually run the command pet store, the Thor by itself, if you provide it no arguments, just runs the help command. And it tells us we've got two available tasks. One is called hello, and in this case, it gives the documentation here. And the other one is help. So I can type pet store help hello, and it'll give me more advanced, uh, more detailed documentation. So again, this is the discoverability thing that I talked about before. I can just always go to that command. I can know exactly what's there. Thor is kind of requiring me to, to put documentation. It's actually my complaint if I don't put this here. So it kind of gives you a push in the right direction to make sure you're going to remember what this thing does in, in a week or a month. Uh, and then when we call pet store hello, it just outputs to the, the, um, the standard out, hello world, and that's pretty much it. So basic, basic hello world, any questions about this, how the file's set up? <coughs> I don't actually really need the, uh, the Rails generator actions, I just threw those in there just to show you. Because unlike generators, you don't get those for free automatically. If you want these, you know, the, the remove file or the generate file, you do need to include those as part of that. Questions? All right, so um, to kind of give you a more, ex an, a more advanced example, um, I was actually I was working with Jim the other day, and we were kind of talking back and forth about Git flow 
and some other uh, interesting tools for, you know, when you're doing a project, you're using Git, you're trying to figure out how to organize things. Uh, one, there's some kind of conventional wisdom stuff you try, you're trying to do. You know, you want to do all your work in a feature branch, you want to take all that stuff and, and check it back into the main line of the code. Um, but that's kind of a lot of typing to be done at the command line. And there are some projects to help you out with this. One of those is Git Flow. Um, I, we, and we talked about this, but it's not, it kind of requires you to kind of drink a lot of the Kool-Aid. You have to have a bunch of long running branches. And I wanted to actually do some of these good practices, but not have to like, you know, drink the entire pitcher of Kool-Aid. Um, so the things I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to, to, to create a feature branch really easily. I wanted to be able to take, um, I wanted to be able to merge any changes that had happened on master, I wanted to merge them into my feature branch before I, I committed my code back. I wanted to do uh, what's, what's called a squash commit, which is an interactive rebase. And if folks know what that is or not, don't worry too much. The idea is you take 12 commits or so, push them into one commit, and then send it back to the main branch. Uh, and then I wanted to, when I'm done, clean up that feature branch, right? When you merge, if you're on a branch, you want to merge that back into the main version of Git. You have to you know, go back to the main, you have to do a merge, and then you have to delete that branch. And I wanted to script all that and make it automated. Um, plus, I needed an example for this talk. So, uh, because of that, I came up with this tool called uh, Gitter Done, which is just the very, um, the first thing that came up when I typed Git into Google. Um, and so, again, it might be a little small on the back, but the command name is GD, just get, get it done. Uh, and there's a, there's a number of commands here that I've, I've, I've put together. We're going to walk through an example of this. But this, the one I'm looking at first is the idea that I want to just create a fit feature. So I want to be able to say, GD feature, give it a new feature, and I want, I want it to create that branch automatically. And so here's just a sample of uh, this particular project. Uh, again, the code might be a little small in the back. I apologize for that. Um, so what I've done here is I've sort of piggybacked on top of the <coughs> functionality that um, Rails uh, generators provide. I'm just basically running a series of Git commands. So this feature up at the top is really just doing a Git checkout, creating a branch with a specific pattern, you know, forward slash features forward slash, and then the name of the feature. It just checks that out. Uh, and then what's more cute is this done command where I'm basically saying, okay, when I'm in a branch, I want to be able to just type gd done, have it commit all that code, run an interactive uh, merge, and then go back to the, merge it back into the main line, and then clean up the branch. And that's exactly what this does. And it's really just, you know, I told Jim I was doing this. He's like, oh, I got to get in there and like play with this. I'll figure out all the code. He's like, he comes back to me the next day. He's like, that's it? It's like one page. What's going on? <laughs> and that's a really nice thing. It took me like literally just a couple hours. And most of that was me just figuring out how Git worked, right? I'd never done an interactive uh, rebase before. I didn't know what was going on. So it was just me figuring out what to call first. Um, so the, the cute things here are I use another library called Grit, which not to throw too many terms, it's basically just what I think GitHub uses to like manage Git repositories. The cute thing in there is I can actually figure out what branch I'm on. So I, can, I don't have to tell it a branch. I can just be on my feature, switch to the master, do the merge, and then clean, clean it up automatically. So what I will point out, this can be looked at later. The, the cute thing here is this, um, one of the other things that Thor provides is <coughs> the options. So sometimes providing just a name is not enough. In this case, I want to be able to provide for feature, I want to say, okay, feature, and then the name of my feature, that automatically gets passed into Thor as a, a, an argument. But sometimes you want to have a bunch of optional command flags like dash s or dash v or whatever. This method options is actually how Thor automatically takes those command line parsers, uh, parses it for you, and passes it in. So in this case, I've defined one flag called squash. It's, uh, it's going to be automatically converted into a Boolean. I've got some documentation around here, and then I provided a true value. And down here, if I want to check, all I have to do is say option squash. It's going to get me that value out, and I can uh, conditionally do things within my command line now. So, kind of a lot here, but I think the, the key takeaways from a pure Thor perspective is you can pass in arguments to your methods, those get exposed as, you know, um, parameters. You can pass in optional arguments if you, if you use the method option to specify as many things as you want and then check them and have them automatically type checked. So, questions about this? Yes. 
Squash is like a separate method called, but I don't see that method defined. Is that? It's, is it? It'd be too long. Yeah, I, I built that method myself. Really, all that is is just inter, uh, rebase interact dash okay. i. There's a merge squash. Is there? Yeah, yeah. It's merge dash dash squash. <coughs> Alright, that's good to know. That's why I come here to learn from the audience, too. <laughs> um, anything else on that? Uh, so, we talked a little bit about uh, testing applications. Um, Chris showed some basic sort of RSpec. The, um, the example that I wanted to look at was more, um, I want to test the actual command line tool itself. So, that tool that I was just looking at there is very dependent on the underlying Git being on the system. So, the tool I chose was uh, Aruba, which is a, uh, a library used with Cucumber. So, who knows what, who does not know what Cucumber is? Okay, so, think of, there's a, a many flavors and test frameworks in the Ruby community. We seem to love having lots and lots of choices. C uh, Cucumber is basically sort of a high-level acceptance framework that lets you write things as sort of English in a very story-like format, and then have it be translated to code underneath. Um, and I like it because it, it expresses syntax very clearly, as you'll see in the next step. Aruba is very cute, though, because it's specifically for command line testing. It handles some of the really complex things that you get with command line testing, which is things like, um, you know, are the actual git commits, the actual git commands being called or not? You know, when I run a series of command line tools and it generates a bunch of files, how do I clean those files up after every test? Um, what's my working directory? Well, Aruba kind of handles all of that, as well as providing a bunch of uh, nice steps for checking what's going on. And so this is actually a couple of the, the features from, a couple of scenarios from <coughs> this project that I've been working on. And you can see I'm testing the first one up top. Uh, and as it reads, you know, when I'm working on a Git project, I want to be able to run uh, using this back tick syntax, GD feature new widget, and then I want to test that the output of my command line is that exact thing. And that's just what Git is actually echoing. And I can also check for file presence and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm relying on what Git itself is doing. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's not a lot of code to write. This is actually checking that Git is really being called and is really doing what I expect it to, which is exactly what I want. I don't want to write tests that, are, that rely on a bunch of mocks that may actually fail if something's not there. Um, and then the second one here, you didn't, I didn't, we didn't look at this command, but this is how I actually, if I'm working in a feature branch, I can automatically pull down from the server, merge it into my feature branch, uh, and then switch, switch back and forth between the branches with one command. So I'm not going to cover Aruba specifically, but if you're interested in, in testing command line apps, this is a good this is a good choice in my opinion. So wait, how do you get it not to actually commit? What do you want to test? No, this is actually committing. So is it on a different repo? It's no, it's actually what this is doing. This step here where I'm setting it up is actually going. It's in a working directory. It actually like does a git init and does an initial commit and sets it up and is actually working with that git repo. So this is this is cheating because there's no origin, but uh, and I haven't figured out how to test things like interactive rebase yet because I don't really want uh, text me popping up when I run these things. Um, but this is a, just an initially good start for me to really kind of wrap my head around how to test this stuff usefully. Yes. Do you know how um, Rails tests their generators? Did you look into that? There is a there is a test there is a test a unit test for generators itself, which does provide some of this stuff. Um, but it didn't. It seemed a little bit less. Thorough than I liked, and I, it didn't work as well with command uh, command line stuff because it says you have to actually pass it what generator you're using. You're saying, you have to basically say test this generator, and then it figures out a bunch of things. I used that in real basic flavors early on, but I've kind of I've kind of gone to this as more useful in my mind. Yeah, it sounds more useful. So because I think you could you could very easily test a Rails generator here as well by just saying when I run Rails G whatever, and that would test it in the same way. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through this because this has already gone a little bit long. We've already covered the basics of what an application template is, but it's the idea when I create a new Rails project, I want to be able to give it a set of commands that should get run after Rails does its things. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's really just a flat RB file. I'm using all of the same uh, Thor and Rails actions to just do a bunch of things. I want to create an initializer, uh, install Capybara Gem, do a Git commit interactively ask if I want to install device, run Capistrano, and then run bundle install. And I can just pass it in as a flag to the Rails new command, and it, it goes about its business. Uh, the cute thing about this, though, is because application templates exist and they don't have to be on your system, 
You can do these with websites. This is actually a website, I think Intridia built this, called railswizard.org. You can go and there's an interactive little thing where you can check all the gems you want, and you say go, and it generates this, and you just run this command and it'll automatically create a project with all those gems already installed for you, which is pretty nice. And that's it. Questions? No? All right, well, thanks for coming. That's my Twitter handle if you want to complain about how good or bad this is. Uh, the Get Her Done uh, project on GitHub, I, I've released there if you want to play with it and look at it. Uh, my slides are up here. I will, for your instructions, yeah. add those to the... Um, I it or something like that. Right. Uh, and then this is the useful documentation I mentioned before. I always have to look up the actions for Thor and, <coughs> and uh, Rails generators, so I, I stuff those in there. So, thank you. Chris and Patrick for giving us this presentation. Thank you to Logic for providing our space tonight, um, and Nvidia for sponsoring. What we are going to do now is uh, give a small elevator heading groups towards um, Rocket Bar. For those of you who um, haven't yet been there, it's on seventh. It's just basically around the corner, seventh between G and the H, I guess, on the left. Um, uh, and again, we have presenters for next month, but after that, we do not. So anyone who um, is interested in presenting, you uh, follow me and should send me an email, um, maybe an outline of the topic you want to discuss. Uh, you can be a person who has never presented before. You can be someone who's presented multiple times. Um, as long as it's something that will be of uh, interest to the group and is an appropriate level of complexity, um, I'm game. So please be in touch. Um, I hope everyone had a good time and learned some stuff. And let us go uh, socialize. Is this for October? Um, I have a person who's never known on October.